Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody. You got all washed up and combed your hair and got clean clothes on and you're here in church. Good to see. Uh, yeah, I do have a bright red tie. Just so everybody can see and not wonder what it is. It's the nativity scene. Okay. So don't wonder what it is. You've seen it. Want to see it closer after church. Boy, it has been one hectic time, hasn't it been? Just trying to get here and trying to get our, our lives together. And then we come to worship and our head is all over the place. Did you ever feel that way? Like, oh. And the church just kind of goes all over. Well, it, I saw somebody do this exercise once. Let's just take a moment and bow our heads and pray. Just for a moment. Let's bow. Take in a deep breath, let it out. One more, let it out. One more, and let it out. Let the Spirit of God fill your heart and be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Sometimes I think we need to do that just because, uh, well, just because. For those of you who don't know me, I'm George Woosnam. I am a retired United Methodist pastor. I live in Lanark. I live by the high school, actually. Um, our house is a yellow house. My wife always wanted a yellow house. And we always lived in parsonages that were pink or blue, and never a yellow. And my wife said, I want a yellow house with white trim. So she's got a yellow house with white trim. After some oh, 45, 47 years living in everybody else's house. And now she's determined, this is my house. It isn't her house. It isn't my house. The only one that I know actually owns it is God. And I hope it's that way with you in your house, that God owns your house, and you're open to, to what God is preparing you for. We'll talk a little bit about that today, particularly uh, we're going to be talking about Mary. And the sermon title is, anybody look at the sermon title this morning? Anybody? Life is short, thank you, God. There, well, there you go, but that's not my sermon title. Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know? Yeah. And we're going to be talking about that. Remember the first time I was here, we did uh, You Better Watch Out? And uh, this week, we're going to be talking about Mary, did you know? So it shouldn't be too hard to figure out. So we have some announcements in the bulletin. I think we have the pastors who are going to be preaching coming up. I'm going to be back again on the 31st. I don't know what we're going to do that day because they're not doing Christmas hymns then. But we'll find something. We'll do something. And there's donuts, coffee, and juice before worship service for that Sunday. So, And that was just on my behalf. I wanted that to happen, right? Oh. I guess that's a normal thing. Okay, well, anyway. And we're still collecting the toilet paper and the uh, paper towels. Is that done? Oh, okay, okay, I apologize, I apologize. Did you get all of it? Today, today is the 17th. But see, no, 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 see, that's exactly what I was thinking, is do the 17th, today's the 17th, and yeah, I agree with you. You going to take it to the Methodist Church? Well, I'm going by that way. I could drop it off. Okay? Good. Are there any other pressing announcements that need to be made that I can flub up? 
Anybody? Oh, I heard something today that uh, at 3 o'clock today, they're going to be closing uh, at um, White Pines. Oh, I'm seeing a bunch of people go, oh, what's that? For the season. For the season. For the season. Yeah, they're going to be done. That's it. Don't. <laughs> and where are you going on vacation? Anywhere away from the lodge kitchen or the lodge or anything to do with the lodge. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there are no other announcements, everybody's nice and quiet. This morning. You're amenable this morning. And you're nice. And I appreciate you and your kindnesses towards me. Well, listen, um, there are no other announcements. And do you feel welcome this morning? Good. Good then I'd like you to turn in your hymnals to number 91. As you are able, if you are able, stand. And we're going to sing hymn number 191. Would you bow with me and pray for a second? Loving God, as we recognize your coming, and as the world, which is so tired and weary, finally receives a break, we ask that, Heavenly Father, you would indeed, to the rest of the world, give that sense of peace and calm, of healing and things being completed. Heavenly Father, be with us this day and touch our hearts. And lift us beyond this place to your kingdoms of great. We ask this, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' most blessed name. And all the people would say, Amen. Uh, turn, if you would, to uh, the call to worship, number 678.
Come, child of Bethlehem, make your presence known to us and dwell in our midst as we worship. Come, servant king, teach us the ways of your kingdom and make our hearts your throne. Come, brother of all, show us the meaning of our humanity. Go before us and lead us to God. Bring us to the fullness of your kingdom. Amen. And we're going to receive the blessing of the, of the offerings. Blessed Lord, we ask your blessing upon the gifts that we have given to your kingdom. And they've been given, Heavenly Father, not taken. They've been received so that they can be used, not ordered. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would use these gifts for your kingdom's sake, for your purpose, as you see best. Strengthen us and give to our hearts a new understanding of what your peace is all about. We ask this, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, and all the people would say, Amen. You may be seated, please. And uh, come to a time of joys and concerns, and I'm not going to categorize which one. Whatever prayer you would have us pray, what might it be? Now you see, oh, there's a hand right over here. Thanks, Troy. Not this time of year. <laughs> I'm just thankful for this time of year where we can anticipate and celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Very good. Thank you. That's a good prayer. Here's a front. All the kids have fun opening presents, presents, but the first thing they do is go to church and then open presents. Okay. Most of them. Okay. Now all the kids go to church first and then open their presents. Good. I have a prayer for my college roommate's mom, Kathy Rothermel. Uh, they just found out a couple weeks ago she has ovarian cancer, and she has surgery in three days to hopefully remove the tumor. I have been hearing more and more concerns about cancer. Uh, I received a message the other day that my cousin, who I grew up with, um, has cancer. And uh, she's not doing very well with it, so. Yes, thank you. And I'll let God do that. I'm not going to tell God how to do that. We'll just ask God to do that. Any others? Seeing none? Let's bow for a moment of prayer together, shall we? Gracious Father, we give you thanks for this day in preparation for the coming of your Son. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that as we prepare our hearts for that day, that you will touch us with a new sense of peace and joy. We thank you for this season, the way it has fulfilled our hearts and minds in times past, but also for the future. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would be with us as we celebrate this holiday and be with all the kids. We pray, Heavenly Father, the kids would come to church first be part of the worship experience before they open their presence. And then may they open their presence with joy. 
And Heavenly Father, that's the point of this whole thing, isn't it? That we have joy in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ. He's the great present that we have all been looking for and waiting for. Now, Heavenly Father, as he comes, open our hearts that we might see him as children as we open up those gifts. We pray, for Heavenly Father, for Kathy, for her recent diagnosis of cancer. That can be a frightening thing, Heavenly Father. The world suddenly stops for those who have it. She's going to have surgery. It's, it's surgically removable. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the doctors can do that and do it well and get it all out. And then, Heavenly Father, that Kathy can begin the process of healing. We pray that her healing is swift and full and complete. We pray for her family who waits, and those friends who wait, that they might not be disappointed in the outcome. We pray, Heavenly Father, too, for world peace. How many generations have prayed for peace? Father, your son came. One of his titles is the Prince of Peace. However you do it, whatever way it is, bring peace to this world, bring peace to this nation, bring peace, bring peace to our homes, and bring peace in our lives. All these things we ask, Father God, in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lighting of the Advent candles. On the fourth Sunday of Advent, we light the angel's candle, and its purple color represents peace. The angels are God's messengers who announce the coming of the Lord. The angel Gabriel spoke to Mary and Joseph to announce the birth of Jesus. The angel sang out with joy to proclaim Jesus' birth to the shepherds. The angel Michael announces the coming of Christ again in the revelation to John. We hear angels' voices even today and wait with joy for Jesus. They visited the lowest of the lows in Jewish society, the shepherds with the most amazing birth announcement. This love is no respecter of persons, but is for all who receive. As we light the fourth candle, we ponder. Luke 2, 8 through 14 says, In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. Let us pray. Holy God, your love for us is amazing. You sent your son who left his glory and throne to confine himself to the dependent state of a newborn, toddler, and child. It is a mystery for which we are so grateful and one in which we hold our arms wide open to receive. Let your love wash over us this Advent season, and as this love washes over us, may we love others by your example. In Jesus' name, amen.
as you remain seated, we're going to sing hymn number 196. Silent Night.
In the Gospels, there's only two versions of the Christmas story as we know it. One of them is from Luke. Luke is the uh, gospel that tends to tell the story from a woman's point of view. The women who are in the Bible are mostly pointed out in the gospel of Luke. And so Luke takes this viewpoint of Mary. We're not talking about Joseph's viewpoint. That is for a later time. But Mary is first. And this is the story as it was given. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, and the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month of her that was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Thus ends the reading. I have seen the word blessed flipped around a whole bunch lately. Have you? How, how, how do you understand the word blessed? What does it mean to be blessed? What does it mean? Sure, go ahead. You'll be really nice to someone. That's a pretty good definition of it. Is that what the angel said? Let's try again. What do some of the others of you think? What does it mean to be blessed or favored? That has been, even in the scripture, twisted around. Anybody? Chosen. Pardon? Chosen. Chosen? Mm -hmm. Chosen for what? Yeah. She, she was chosen to be the mother of Jesus. That's what that blessed means. Have you ever heard the term, God bless America? Yeah. What does it mean? Pour favor on? Okay, what is it, you're, you're, you're right. What does it mean to pour favor on, do you think? Well, that's, a, that's an unfair question. It's really unfair of me, isn't it? Say, Pastor, you're being mean. <laughs> Pastor's being mean. Think about it for a moment. She's going to have a baby. How old do you think she is? First of all, how do we know that she's a virgin? 
just because the angel said so. The word for virgin in Greek is Parthenia. Have you ever heard of the Parthenon in Greece, in Athens? Yeah, same word. It means a young girl of meritable age. And in Jesus' day, a young girl of meritable age was, anybody want to take a guess? You don't have to, but you want to take a guess? 14? 14? That's a pretty good guess. 12? That's also a pretty good guess. It could go down as low as 10. Can you imagine a young girl? Let's pick the middle. Somebody about the age of 12 having a baby. What would we do today if we saw a young 12-year-old having a baby? What would you, what, you just choked her. <laughs> oh boy, would you be in trouble? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In fact, it gets so bad, that the, the whole question about it really even does play on Mary. We'll get to that in a little bit. But could you imagine Mary, she's not married, right? Right? She's not married. She's betrothed, but she's not married. She has a guy standing in the wings. His name is Joseph. And Joseph's standing in the wings. How old is Joseph? 45. <laughs> Some people have guessed that. That would not be a bad guess. Not, not be a bad guess at all. What some of the others think? Younger. Younger, like what? Early 20s, 21, 22, something like that. Might be a good guess. We do not know. There is no indication of Joseph's age. The words that are used for Mary give us that age. But the words that are used for Joseph tell us nothing. He could be 22. He could be 45. Some of the early pictures, and I love this, I'm sorry I get into this stuff, but some of the early pictures that are depicted of Joseph picture him to be somewhere around 70. Well, they want to make sure that Mary is a virgin. An old guy's out of the picture. What is going on? Let's figure it out. Teenager, unwed mother, Whoopee! I can't wait. I can just hear Mary saying it. I, that's great. Tell me more, Angel. Do you think any of that's going through her head? Particularly at 14, 12. Is that going through her head at all? Maybe not. But do you realize that Mary could have been stoned? She was 14, pregnant, and no husband. And in those days, children that age were taken out and stoned. And I don't mean taking small rocks. I mean taking boulders, lifting them up your head, and smashing them down. Mary could have been dead. God has an interesting way of showing his favor, doesn't he? What does it mean to be blessed? Maybe it's not all the fun that we all think it might be. Maybe it's harsh. Maybe it's hard. Years ago, a psychologist named Thomas Holmes developed a scale to measure what stress would be like. Um, and in that measurement, he came up with numbers scheduled for each particular thing. For example, moving to a new home. How many of you have ever moved from one home to another? How stressful was it? You're even shaking your head. Stressful. It's a pretty high rating. It's a rating about 15 to 20. 
How many of you had a new relationship in your life? Anybody? Oh, I hope all of you have had a new relationship in your life. That is worth 10. How about uh, a marriage? What is that worth? <laughs> you may be right. But you get the idea. Now think of all the things that Mary went through. Okay. She met an angel. That was harsh. That had stress in it. The angel told her that she was going to become pregnant. That was stress there. She was told that this son would be very, very special. There's stress in that. Can you imagine trying to raise, in your own mind, a child that you know that is going to be president of the United States? How many here think they could raise such a child? I'm not seeing any hands. Hard, hard. There again, more points. Mary would, in fact, have to go to Bethlehem to be registered with Joseph, who is still not her husband. And they are supposed to have this child. And when they have the child, where does she have the child? In a nice room? No. In her own home? which was customary at that time. No. She has a child in the stable with animals all around. And the only place she has to lay the child is in a manger, which is a feeding trough. Is this what you want for your child? Is this how you're going to raise a king? And then while she is still getting over having delivered this baby, she has all these people come in. She has shepherds come in. She has wise men come in. She has threats on her life and her child's life because she finds out the king is after him and wants to kill him. And then from that, they have to make an escape to Egypt so that they can survive, just to survive. And how they're going to make a living, goodness knows. How many stress points is that worth? A writer by the name of uh, uh, Bridget Coons calculated it out that she would have 424 points of stress. 424 points of stress. And the doctor who put it together, Holmes, said that people get sick at 200. Was she sick? Was she doubly sick? Was she just stressed out with it all? Or was it the fact that she remembered what the angel said and she would just let it rest in God's hands? You know, it's so hard for us when we hear something to give everything over to God, isn't it? We try to figure it out, work it out, and twist it out, and make sure it comes out the way we think it ought to come out. When the reality is we have no clue what God really is thinking. Anybody here think they think like God? I know I don't. I know every time I thought I did, <laughs> the roof caved in. I don't know what God is thinking, no matter how much theological training I have had. But then the story of Elizabeth. Mary goes immediately from being told she's going to have this child, she immediately goes to her cousin, who's named Elizabeth, who is in the country, the hill country, away from people, away from town, to live with Elizabeth, who herself 
is now expecting. Let me ask you, what's the greater miracle? Mary, who is 12, being talked to by an angel, being told this story, or Elizabeth, who can't have a child, who has tried to have a child for years, and suddenly she finds she's expecting. Which one is more of a miracle? Anybody? They probably are both the same. They probably are both the same. But I think in most dances, Elizabeth would even be greater. She's been trying and trying and trying and can't get pregnant. Still with the same husband. And suddenly she's expecting. Who has the joy? I think it's Elizabeth. She's been trying for years and years and years and years. Her husband is, is, is part of the priestly class. He goes to the temple and he prays. Now, and you want to talk about blessed. Ladies, don't talk about blessed. He goes to pray, asking for a son, and immediately God strikes him so he can't speak. He can't talk. Now that, my wife says, is a true miracle. A husband who says nothing. Boy, I'd love that, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So she can go through her whole pregnancy without having to listen to her husband moan and groan. <laughs> I think it's cute. I think it's funny. I think it's a miracle. But I want you to hear what the angel says to Mary about this whole thing. He says, with God, nothing is impossible. And I have to think, in Mary's mind, that was still circulating. With God, nothing is impossible. Do you believe that this church can grow? Why? How many years have you been here? Troy, how many years have you been here, this church been here? Since 1859, anybody want to do the calculation? <coughs> Rough guess? Well, that's 100 anyway. <laughs> and 59 would probably be, what, another 50, 60? 160 years? Why haven't you grown? Why aren't you huge? Why haven't you added on to the church? And I can say the same thing about United Methodist Church. I can say the same thing about Lutheran Church. I can say the same thing about the Catholic Church. I can say, go on down the line. I don't think we believe that with God, nothing is impossible. I sat in too many committee meetings where people go, oh, well, we can't do that. Well, we should have thought of that before, but it's too late. How many of you have ever been in business? Farm? Look at your crops and say, it's impossible. I, I, I tell you, I didn't think anybody was going to get any crop this last summer with the drought the way it was. How many of you had a reasonable crop come in? With God, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. And this church can grow if it's God's will. Because with God, I heard a couple of you. I want you to all say it because I think you got to believe it. Because with God, there you go. Believe it. Believe it. Believe it. With God, nothing is impossible. God overpowers us, but not without our will and not without certainty. 
Not without certainty. See, God doesn't make our faith certain. He doesn't. Are you certain to go through life with no troubles because you're a Christian? Are you certain to go through life without suffering because you're a Christian? Are you certain that when you go home, you're going to have food on the table? How about three years from now? We don't know, do we? But that is what faith is all about. Our faith is born in our uncertainty. And when we are uncertain in our faith and we trust it to God's will, we gain a benefit. And the benefit is we find that there is something there that we didn't anticipate. This is going to sound stupid, but I'm going to say it anyway. When I was a kid, uh, I wasn't always sure what I was going to get for Christmas. Oh, I'd ask for things, and my parents tried their best to get what they could. My father was an industrial engineer, which meant he had a decent job. And he worked for a company that I think all of you have probably heard of. He worked for Alice Chalmers. But the interesting thing is, out of all of that, there was always a present that I hadn't anticipated. And more times than not, on Christmas Day, that was the, Christmas, that was the gift I spent the time with. Something I didn't anticipate but I really enjoyed. That's what a gift is from God. That's what a gift is from God. You can't anticipate what it's going to be. You don't know what it's going to be. But it will be there. That's the one thing you can count on. It will be there. God never overpowers us with our certainty, but we see life through a glass darkly but then we will see God face to face when we get to the kingdom. The last thing that this scripture brings out is be thankful to a young woman who said yes. I, I think we look across this and we say, well, Mary had no choice. This is what was going to happen. Mary had a choice. Mary could have said no, and the angel would have departed and that would have been it. Nothing more would have been said. That was it. But because this young woman, 12 years old, said yes to God and put herself and others in danger, because of that, we have a Lord. A Lord who loves us, who cares for us, who died for us, and rose for our sakes. And it was due to the fact that a young village girl named Mary said yes to God. Obedience is not a fashionable world, word in our world today, is it? Not too many people go and go, oh, I'd like to do that. Let me do it. Most of us kind of sit back and wait for somebody else to either stand up or chosen. Uh, the military was that way. Now the sergeant would say, I want three volunteers, you, you, and you. And that was your volunteering. Yeah, that's the way we think of God working. It's not the way God worked. It's the obedience. Now how does that translate? Some of you may remember uh, a woman who's now a saint in the Catholic Church. Her name was Mother Teresa. Anybody remember Mother Teresa? Shake your head if you do. Do you? Mother Teresa was on a television program um, in 1985, and she was talking about AIDS. You know, we knew nothing about AIDS back then. We didn't know how it was transmitted, where it came from, how it was started, why it was growing so fast. All we knew was people had it and other people could get it from them. That's what we knew. 
And here was Mother Teresa with two young emaciated men coming out of prison. They were in prison because they were locked there to isolate them away. And she had her arms around them and was partly carrying them. Mother Teresa herself wasn't very big. She wasn't very strong, but she was actually carrying the weight of these two young men. And they were all over her. And she was unafraid. She looked in their eyes, and she talked with them straightly. Another man by the name of Chuck Colson. Anybody remember Chuck Colson? Chuck Colson was watching that on TV. He said, she's got to be an idiot. Why would she put herself in that? She's got a, an order that depends upon her, and the Catholic Church depends upon her. How in the world is it that she does that? I could never do that. Well, he happened to see it uh, when he was in North Carolina. He was talking with women who were in prison, talking about the love of Christ. And as he was finishing up his program, the warden came to him and said, would you mind talking with Betsy Shipp? She has AIDS. And she has her own room on the other side of the prison. Would you talk with Bessie? And his first inclination was to say, absolutely not. But he said, yeah. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll do it. I think it's stupid, but I think Mother Teresa gave me the idea. It's doable. So I'll go to the room and I'll talk with her. Not touch her. I'm going to stand back and I'll just talk with her. And when they got to the room, he and the, the chaplain of the prison who knocked on the door, they were the first persons to see her in six weeks. Can you imagine being totally isolated from anybody, not seeing another person for six weeks? Their food was pushed underneath the door. And when they got there, she was reading her scriptures. And Chuck said, Bessie, have you met Jesus Christ? And she said, Mr. Colson, I've been looking. I've been going over scripture and reading and reading and reading, but I can't find him. I just can't find him in my heart. And he did something. Here was a person who didn't know Jesus. And he put his hand in hers and held it. He said, Bessie, let's pray together. So she, Chuck Colson, and the chaplain spent an hour in prayer. When they came out of prayer, Chuck looked at her eyes and they were, she'd been crying. She said, all my life I've wanted to see the Savior who put my life together, who helped me to find peace. And Chuck Colson said, that was the first time in my ministry I felt that I knew why God had to put this upon me. I did this, put my life in danger because it's what I needed to do. That's what God called me to do. Three weeks later, Chuck got a call from the prison that Bessie had died. And Chuck was happy. He was, it was strange. I felt happy. Because here was a woman who had an incurable disease who is going home to our Savior to be with God in the right kingdom. No more illness, no more suffering, no more isolation, no more bad looks or bad talks. God had saved me. And 
Chuck said, I shuddered because I thought if I had only said no, I don't want to go see her, they wouldn't have forced me. And that young woman probably would not have had the chance to meet Jesus Christ. What are you willing to risk? What are you willing to do? Here's Mary, 12 year old, whose life is now threatened, whose joy is now threatened, whose possibility of hope was almost long gone. And yet she said yes to one of the most impossible tasks on earth. Mary. Mary, did you know? Did you know all these things that were going on? Have you been watching the words on the screen? Did you know? Did it matter whether she knew? No. It didn't. What mattered is that she knew her Christ, who her child, who would save her and all of us. When you get home tonight, say a prayer of thanks to Mary for all that she's done. Amen. We ask you to turn in your hymnal number 201. Tell me the peace of Christ, which comes to all people through Mary. May that Christ bring you consolation, hope, anticipation, and joy. Go from this place and serve the Lord with happy hearts. Amen. <laughs>